I want to do a short um, introduction to Rhino and Grasshopper and parametric design. You guys have been using Rhino um, pretty consistently now um, as a modeler and a, it's very flexible and effective. Um, but what it is is when you're modeling in Rhino you model something and you get it and then if you have to do it again you just have to remake it and go through that whole process. So once you pair Rhino with Grasshopper what you're going to get is the ability to, to almost have an open command string where you can adjust pieces of the command string at will and have a lot more ability to iterate um, and test your design ideas or design processes as opposed to just doing one and then redoing it and redoing it and redoing it. So we're going to take a look at that a little bit um, and sort of the process you've been in and how we're going to move into the next one. So the first thing um, I wanted to point out is a lot of people get a little um, intimidated by going into programming or visual programming, which is what Grasshopper is. This is actually Dynamo, but it's a very similar process. Um, and it's it's really not that difficult. It's almost like pulling apart the commands that you're using in Rhino and being able to adjust them. The difficulty comes in is that there are a lot more questions to answer in that process than you had to when you were giving prepackaged commands. Um, and then I want to talk about like how flexible the process is and how it really can open up your design process. And not only that, but open up the, the way that you think about design and, and approach it. Um, and then you can, I'd, we'll talk about maybe um, identifying the places where you can implement visual programming in your design process um, because it's not a practical for everything and sometimes it's not efficient. Um, so the demystification part. Um, a lot of times when people see this, um, they look, and just as an example, they see code like on the right hand side of the page and they're like, oh, I don't want to do that. Or some of you may be coders already and familiar. Um, or they see these definitions that are creating these really complex things um, that seem overwhelming um, and, and complicated. Um, not only complex, but complicated. But really, um, if you simplify it down and just focus it on what you want to do, uh, then you can really implement it effectively. You don't have to implement it across your whole design, but um, it's it can actually be quite a lot of fun. And really, you're already doing it, even if you're doing analog design with trace paper and things like that. You're thinking recursively. This the way that you produce the different variations of what you think are a little bit different. So hopefully, we can get this and make it you know, sort of an engaging and exciting process for you as opposed to something that's intimidating. Um, it can be, but it doesn't have to be at all. So just think about how you're working already. Um, you're already going through doing different versions, sketching in your sketchbook, using trace paper, drawing over digital things, and just making variations on things um, that you're thinking about in your design process. Now these are um, basically creative processes so you're making one thing and then to edit it, it's a little difficult and so you might remake it again and remake it again and remake it again so it's sort of a recreation process but you can really um, at this point you're handling huge amounts of information that are layered upon each other um, and also through time so as things change over time you're thinking about the way that things work and adjusting for that and then recreating your models and updating your design process and your focus so you're really already doing it we're really capable you know um, within our own processes and our own minds of handling this massive amounts of information but once you get into uh, parametric design, then that will give you sort of an ability to hook into the digital process some of the things you want to test. So it's a different type of layering. So let's talk about um, sort of the logical procession again, sort of the next idea that I'd like to talk about is that really when you're, um, when you're working in Rhino, it's a one and done or SketchUp or some other um, non-parametric program. It's really kind of a one and done thing. Like you model it out and then it sits there and you might put materials on it, put views on it. But then if you want to adjust it, you have to sort of remake that whole thing, start that whole process over. The parametric design 
is really more about creating an armature or a process that you can adjust and it will give you different variations of the thing that you're interested in within a certain limitations obviously so for example here's a CCTV tower which generally to maybe um, model that analog is not that difficult you know you could do it in whatever program you choose but to do different variations with different slopes and different thicknesses of things it becomes sort of you know the the process becomes laborious and repetitive and uh, takes a long time but if you spend some time ahead of time putting together a rig right so on the left hand side you see here a rig that controls the topology of the model then you can spit out all sorts of variations and not only that but you can get the dimensions and the thicknesses and the volumes and everything of that object that you're creating so there's a, there's a little bit more input in the beginning, but then the process that you create um, can be very effective. So rigging, it's very much like animation rigging. So when a modeler finishes a building character, it's, it's, it's static or a sculptor, you know, like a marble sculpture. And what we're trying to get away from is that sort of one and done, it's stuck there. And we move into a more idea of sort of a, a 3D character model where before the actual like skin is put on the model, the bones are created and the relationships between those bones are defined. So by the time it gets to the final part, it's really just the, <clears throat> the muscles and, and skin hanging on this sort of armature. And so you're sort of reversing the process a little bit. You're not so much thinking about the thing, you're thinking about the way the thing can be moved and adjusted, right? So if you take a look at um, what that means, I, I talked about it a little bit before, is that it also means that because you have this rig that's working around underneath that controls this process, you can actually mine information from it and break it down into different pieces and get data from it. <clears throat> so this is an example of a, um, of a Revit adaptive component, which is very similar in a way to um, Grasshopper. And in, in this case, you can go through and based on the amount of columns that you have of this piece, you can actually, if you look at the model schedule on the right hand side, you can start to break it down. Now this is not Grasshopper, but it's an example of sort of how you can start to understand and develop um, data sets from the model based on that rig, which is pretty exciting. Okay, and so um, you can also import, export, all sorts of geometry data text points lists so you're not limited to really the command strings that are within the program like in Rhino um, you can actually start to bring Excel data in and push it out and, and do round trips and all this kind of stuff so it really opens up a much broader spectrum of what is design so so let's talk a little bit about sort of the process of thinking about this. Um, and after, after this lecture, we're gonna talk more specifically about this, but really it changes kind of the way eventually that you think about design process flow, um, not to make it different, but to sort of um, augment it. So really, instead of thinking about what do I want this to look like or what is the character or what what string of commands do I need to do to get this sort of space that I'm looking for? Really what you're thinking about is what do I want to test? What do I want to look at? What are the parameters? So the parameters would be the inputs like in a command string, you know, like if you're drawing a circle, what's the radius? Where's the center of it so I can start it? So you start to think about those things and how you can adjust them to sort of test ideas or processes that you're interested in exploring. So what is your design intent, right? Um, and how do the parameters and constraints address that design intent? And then you start to define the parameters and then you really start to make sort of this recipe or variation of parameters within that. Um, so if you go and look maybe specifically at a project versus sort of a general scheme, you define and represent the spatial divisions of a particular project, right? So represent that principle in three variations. So okay, we'll look at a grid and, and taking something very sort of straightforward and how to control the X and Y scale and maybe the column height and the column shape of the column that goes on that grid. So then when you get to the program, you start to, and this is like a pseudo code, you start going through and thinking about like how you're going to approach it. And notice, 
it starts at rectangular grid, you can vary the spacing, and then maybe you have a circle that varies the radius, and then you have an extrude that you could vary the height. So all of those sort of parameters are open, and you can just play with those a little bit. Notice that the process starts with a rectangular grid. It doesn't necessarily start with the column. Like if you're in Rhino and you're starting to think about things, you're like, well, I'll make this column and then I'll copy it. But we'll take a look at sort of the sort of little bit of reversal of that process, which I think is an important point. Okay, so um, creation flow, um, you know, here's, here's an idea of a representation of that. So you see the rectangular grid from Grasshopper, we're varying the spacing, and then you'll see the radius for the circle varying that, and then you see the extrude. And so you have control, you're basically creating a command string that gives you a column grid, right? Um, and again, notice that the rectangular grid is in front and the circle comes and the extrude kind of come at the end. All right, so really straightforward. You guys have been watching some videos already, so you should start to kind of understand this, is that you have inputs and outputs. Um, so parameters like points and curve containers store information. So they have, they store data. Um, so it might have a point, it might have a curve, it might have a set of numbers, it might have something, but that's like an input. And then you can store that information and output it at the other side, right? And then you have components, and those components process information. So you have the information that may come from a, a parameter, um, and it might come in and process it and then put it out. So like in the case of this point, you would just have some kind of number coming into the X, Y, and Z, and that would output a point in the X, Y, Z Cartesian coordinate system. Um, and for all of these components, you can right click on them for options um, on various parts of them, and it'll give you various options, and it'll also have a title for it. Um, just in a more general scheme of things, to talk about how programs work specifically in relationship to each other, you are in such a huge pool of digital tools. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, we're just going to focus really, you know, over here on Rhino and Grasshopper right now, but you should be aware that there is a whole, and this is, you know, just scraping the top of it, there's a whole universe of options out there. So, you know, Python coding can come directly into Grasshopper and Rhino. You can push in Excel. There's Arduino, so you can actually start to, you know, control physical things from Grasshopper. And then there's also the combination of like, how do you get Rhino into other programs like Revit that also has a visual programmer and the people have written these various uh, programs like Hummingbird and Mantis Shrimp that connect these things together. So it starts to become sort of this whole universe of data and data control, which is also quite, a, you know, it's, it's sometimes overwhelming, but also I think it speaks to the point that we're really sort of opening up the systems of these very complex programs with these visual programmers and we're, uh, our ability to sort of get into the guts of them now and actually make them talk to each other is pretty amazing.